Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, an update on the West Lake landfill in North St. Louis, where 175,000 tons of radioactive material left over from the Manhattan Project is illegally buried in a landfill where there is both an underground fire heading towards it and flooding. Sounds like the plot for a high-budget thriller and son of a gun, that looks like what it is. We'll be talking with Brian DeLear, who lives near the Westlake Landfill, is involved and has been for many years in ecological energy issues, and is currently running for public office as state representative. He's been a great source for Nuclear Hot Seat on the politics behind the nuclear hot potato in North St. Louis, and he's got some stunners for us as he puts together the big picture of what's going on in St. Louis. Plus, we'll have our popular Num Nuts of the Week feature, the nuclear reactor duck and cover report, activist shout-outs combined with the final thought, and more in nuclear information than you're going to get out of any media organization run by General Electric. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, January 5th, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. There's absolutely no way to bring you up to date on three weeks of nuclear news. I had over 85 pages of source material to pull from, so I'll just skim over the stories to give you an overview as best I can, starting with the United States. Starting with the Westlake Landfill in North St. Louis where the Environmental Protection Agency said on Thursday, December 31st, that yes, it would require a barrier to separate the radioactively contaminated Westlake landfill from the smoldering Bridgeton landfill right next door. It's a decision that's been under consideration by the EPA for more than two years, with initial survey work on the barrier starting in October of 2013. Way to go, EPA! EPA spokesmodel Angela Breeze said, Based on the information we have to date, we do think it's prudent to proceed with the installation of the barrier. And while it is being received as an excellent step to take, rather tepid in the enthusiasm department, but that could be related to the fact that in October, EPA announced that they would have plans on a barrier by the end of the year, and by golly, by getting it in on the afternoon of December 31st at the end of a news cycle on a day that nobody wants to listen to the news, well, sure, that's the perfect time to announce it. Considering October is also when the first responders in the North St. Louis area announced their emergency plan should the fire intersect with the radioactive waste, along with the estimate that this could take place in as soon as three to six months. Note that December 31st was just a hair short of three months. No word as to the current location of the fire. The day before, on December 30th, a new peer-reviewed scientific study by Robert Alvarez, Marco Kaltofen, and Lucas Hickson tracked legacy radionuclides in St. Louis, Missouri, by tracking the lead-210 in the environment. This revealed massive off-site radioactive contamination from the Westlake landfill. We'll have a link to the actual study and to news reports on it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 237. It's believed that that contamination is being spread even further by stormwater runoff from the Superfund site, that was captured last week on multiple videos and still shots. This will be discussed at some length during our interview today, so stay tuned. And isn't it interesting, in light of all the problems getting a cleanup in North St. Louis, that in Parks Township, Pennsylvania, after finding a greater-than-expected amount of special nuclear material, 
potentially suitable for nuclear explosives, the Army Corps of Engineers on Tuesday announced its decision to remove 36,000 tons of radioactive material from a nuclear dump in Parks Township. $350 million is what the project is going to cost. And despite complaints by the site owner, BWX Technology, which was formerly Babcock and Wilcox, maker of bad quality nuclear reactors at Three Mile Island, the cleanup in Pennsylvania will go ahead. Why did they get a cleanup and North St. Louis doesn't? I predict there's something dirtier here than anybody has yet figured out. Time for the nuclear hot seat. Duck! (laughs) And cover report. Focusing on the finer points of what can go wrong at nuclear reactors. At the Waterford 3 nuclear power plant in Kelowna, Louisiana, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission informed the owners, Entergy Corporation, that they face possible penalties because contractors failed to conduct hourly firewatch inspections within the plant for about 15 months, and they falsified records for 10 months to show that inspections occurred. Portions of land around the now-shuttered San Onofre nuclear facility in Southern California, quote, may be contaminated, according to the Navy, which wants an accounting from Southern California Edison, which owned and operated San Onofre before the Navy takes the land back. Based on a letter sent to the investigative team at NBC7 Investigates in San Diego, Maureen Brown, a spokesmodel for Southern California Edison, said, There is no current radiological contamination, and readings are normal background radiation levels. This was on October 2nd. However, new documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act show that SCE's own internal reports show the site may be contaminated. (coughs) Plutonium has escaped from the Hanford nuclear site in Washington State in the form of air coolers about the size of a shoebox that are worn by workers on the site to make their protective suits more comfortable. 21 contaminated coolers have been found, most at the Hanford Fire Station, and two in the trunk of a salesman's car in Kennewick, Washington. Other plutonium-contaminated material is being searched for as far away as Ohio and Pennsylvania. (coughs) Degraded power cables at the Akani Nuclear Power Facility in South Carolina has led to a special inspection by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You'd think the NRC would be inspecting all along and would have caught the problem first. (coughs) The NRC has granted Entergy, owner-operators of the now-shuttered Vermont Yankee Nuclear Facility, a permanent partial exemption from regulations that require retention of records for certain systems, structures, and components. I can hear the sound of Entergy clear-cutting the evidence via Shredder all the way on this coast. (coughs) The NRC is keeping an eye on rapidly rising water levels along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers as El Nino continues to deposit record rainfall. Significant flooding is expected to persist for another two weeks in parts of Nebraska, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, potentially impacting Fort Calhoun, Cooper, Callaway, Arkansas Nuclear One, Grand Gulf, and Riverbend nuclear plants. (coughs) And National Geographic is carrying an article, As Sea Levels Rise, Are Coastal Nuclear Plants Ready? Ooh, teacher, teacher, I bet I know the answer to that one. We'll have a link up on the website. And that concludes this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Duck (coughs) and Cover Report. A few more U.S. headlines. The uranium levels in soil has been spiking at a mine near the Grand Canyon. Actor James Cromwell, best known for his role as the father in the movie Babe, was arrested while protesting the building of a power plant in upstate New York, at Wawayanda, New York, to be specific. California's Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom, has ordered an environmental review of the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, saying it will need to pass a broad California Environmental Quality Act review, which it was not subject to prior to opening in 1985, and it's built on all kinds of intersecting earthquake faults, so hopefully this will be a step towards getting it closed. 
And this Numbnuts adjacent story out of Hawaii, where experts, put that in quotes, are baffled by the mystery of Hawaii's disappearing humpback whales. They usually arrive in the waters off Hawaii in December, but not this year. I wonder why. As songwriter Tom English might sing in his song, what part of Fukushima do you not understand? Speaking of Fukushima, in Japan on the 18th of December, TEPCO reported to the Japanese Nuclear Regulatory Authority that the underground wall that they built has ended up increasing the speed with which groundwater is being retained in the plant buildings. It's water, water everywhere for TEPCO, and they've even considered evaporating 800,000 cubic meters of tritium water into the air, which would be a really, really bad idea, according to Dr. Ian Fairley, the British researcher who wrote, First, evaporating this radioactive water will not isolate the radioactivity. All it would do is convert liquid tritiated water to tritiated water vapor, which would be emitted to the air at Fukushima and result in high exposures to those downwind of the plumes. Other problems stated by Fairley included evaporation making the problem worse as aerial emissions are more hazardous than liquid discharges to the sea and the fact that tritium is not, quote-unquote, relatively harmless, as the propaganda puts out. Ian has a website, Ian Fairley, I-A-N, F like Frank, A-I-R-L-I-E dot org, and that's where you'll find a PDF of his report on tritium. TEPCO is wanting to restart the nuclear reactors at Kashiwazaki Kariwa nuclear plant, but need to gain public consent in order to do so. So they're running TV commercials in Niigata Prefecture, which is where the facility is located. In the evacuated town of Futaba in Fukushima Prefecture, workers are finally removing a sign which touted the pro-nuclear premise, nuclear power is the energy of a bright future, in referring to the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facilities. And now, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound a week. The one thing you never want to reuse, repurpose, and recycle is radioactive waste. But try telling that to the Environmental Ministry of Japan, which has announced that they plan to reuse contaminated soil in public construction projects. That's right. Share the pain. Just spread that contamination around. Any contaminated materials or soil that has fewer than, are you ready, eight thousand becquerels of radiation per kilogram. The ministry claims that 99.8 percent of this contaminated soil can be reused, and they plan to start doing so as of April of 2016. I'm sure plenty of it is going to be recycled into the 2020 radioactive Tokyo No Olympics. The ministry does admit that convincing the public and construction companies to use this soil is a bit of a challenge. But hey, if you're going to commit a crime against humanity, make it a big one. And that's why you, Environment Ministry of Japan, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. With thanks and appreciation to FukuLeaks.org, whose item from December 22nd I lifted virtually word for word. Go check out their site. They're a really good source. On December 18th, at the Leningrad Nuclear Power Plant, 80 kilometers, 50 miles from St. Petersburg on the Gulf of Finland, a pipe-carrying steam cracked and radioactive steam was emitted in bulk into the atmosphere, a situation which continued for at least a two-day period of time. The steam was visible outside the facility, triggering widespread panic as some residents in St. Petersburg tried to flee the city. Others bought iodine to try and protect against radiation poisoning. And while officials said there was no radiation leak and it was just steam, ecologists said denial was not to be trusted due to memories of Chernobyl. Two days of coverage, and then the story dried up. Ah, Russia. In Taiwan on December 26th, 
One of two reactors at Taiwan's nuclear power plant broke down on Saturday afternoon. That leaves only two of the six nuclear reactors at the country's three nuclear power plants still in operation. In Germany, many residents are upset, if not outraged, at the relaunch of the Dehange II Belgian nuclear power plant that was shut down because of micro cracks. Can't say that I blame them. In North Wales, the Wyfla nuclear power plant has finally closed down after more than 40 years in service. In the UK, radioactive waste from the Sellafield nuclear facility in Cumbria is contaminating shellfish hundreds of kilometers away on the west coast of Scotland. This, according to a new scientific study, in South Korea. Construction will begin next year on a museum dedicated to showing the horror of the August 1945 atomic bombings of Hiroshima. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., the National Park Service is moving ahead with three national parks, glorifying the science behind the atomic bomb. The three sites are Trinity in New Mexico, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and the Hanford site in Washington State. No word if campfires. S'mores and kumbaya are mandatory at these U.S. parks. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, it's a new year with 52 weeks of nuclear shenanigans for Nuclear Hot Seat to report on.、Mm -mm -mm. If you care about honest, vetted information, as well as in-person reporting on the events and issues that come up, we're going to need your help in the coming year. Nuclear Hot Seat has travel plans to get me to St. Louis to attend the Uranium Film Festival. There's a possible road trip under discussion to the East Coast, and I have the ultimate goal of attending the Excellence in Journalism conference in New Orleans in September, so that more than 1,000 journalists and news directors who attend can be lobbied in person to cover our issues from a different perspective, of course. We need your help to make that happen. You can donate to Nuclear Hot Seat by going to nuclearhotseat.com and clicking on the big red donate button. You can donate either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer not to donate online, you can email info at nuclearhotseat.com for a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you can do to help us meet our goals in taking down this nuclear monstrosity in the coming year, you have my deepest gratitude. Brian Delir was an interview guest on Nuclear Hot Seat number two twenty eight, and he was so terrific in bringing us to an understanding of the political situation that is taking place there that we decided to have him back for an update. Byron Delir lives near the Westlake landfill and has been involved in clean energy issues as chairman and CEO of Energy Equity Funding. He's a columnist with Examiner dot com, where he writes on nuclear issues. Was founder of Global Peace Solution, and is currently running for state representative. We spoke about the latest developments on site at Westlake, as well as more on the politics behind this nuclear hot potato. Note that when Byron speaks about the Atomic Energy Commission, this is a reference to the agency that, in 1977, was turned into the Department of Energy under then President Jimmy Carter. Byron Delir, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Levy, thank you so much for having me.、Um, I enjoy your program immensely, and you're doing a great service for、uh, drilling down with greater detail into these issues, which we don't normally see in, in the mainstream media. Well, let's get started and do that right now. There's been a lot happening in connection with the Westlake landfill, and we're going to range over a number of different topics. But one thing that's uppermost in my mind right now is that in late December. A peer-reviewed study on radioactive contamination of St. Louis County by the Westlake Landfill was published in the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity. Byron, how has this report been received by the activists and also the political powers who are involved with both the people in the area and also with Republic Services? 
There's been quite a lot of anticipation with regard to this report. It's It's been in the works for a couple of years. And one of the uh, chief authors of the report, Bob Alvarez, is a nuclear policy expert from Washington, D.C. And the other two authors are Marco Kaltefen and Lucas Hickson. And the report is, like you mentioned, peer-reviewed. It is scientific evidence. It is independent evidence that there is significant radiological contamination from the Westlake landfill that is moving off-site. What's key here is that some of the agencies, for example, the EPA, don't necessarily want to admit that the presence of this radioactive material is that much of a threat to the community. In fact, in a public hearing in October, uh, Mark Haig, who's the regional director of the EPA, was asked if there had been any radiological contamination moving off-site, and he said, we don't really have evidence of that. That may technically be true, but the problem is, is that the EPA is not doing comprehensive testing off-site of soil, and basically, if they don't look for it, they don't see it. And I got to tell you, I guess you could do this for a number of years, but this community has been suffering from the presence of this radioactive material for now over 40 years, and people are desperate for a solution. There is a severe impact on local residents here, cancer clusters, sicknesses, illnesses. And I know that you've covered this a number of times with a number of your guests, but needless to say, uh, this report that has come out only is confirming a building consensus amongst independent expert observers that indeed the material that has been illegally dumped at Westlake is threatening the community and most likely poisoning folks. The report confirms that radiologically contaminated material at Westlake has been leaching off-site and has been doing so polluting the environment for years and most likely poisoning the nearby residents as the recent survey that was put together by the Coldwater Creek Group can attest. Let's look at the EPA for a moment. How long has EPA had any kind of mandate over this site, and what have or have not been their actions? The EPA declared the Westlake Landfill a Superfund site in 1990. And just to kind of delve into the history here, 43,000 to 48,000 tons of radiologically contaminated material that's been dumped at Westlake came from the Manhattan Project during World War II. St. Louis played an extremely pivotal role in the Manhattan Project in developing the first working atomic weapons. In essence, the foundation stones of nuclear weaponry itself were laid here in St. Louis. And it generated hundreds of thousands of tons of nuclear waste byproducts, which have been sadly polluting the North County area. There are over 100 contaminated sites. All of those sites have been put under the pertinent federal cleanup program, which is by the Army Corps of Engineers called FUSRAP, except for the Westlake landfill. Why is it that Westlake is not under the FUSRAP program? It's a pretty convoluted and complex uh, sordid tale, to be sure. Essentially, what happened is the Atomic Energy Commission in 1962 auctioned off 125,000 tons of this material from the world's first nuclear waste dump, essentially, which was at the St. Louis airport site. And they sold it for a buck a ton. And they sold it to a small private operator called Contemporary Metals. And then there was this kind of period of nuclear hot potato, which we covered in our earlier interview, Libby, in which this material was exchanged from one small private entity to another private entity. And this entire time, the Atomic Energy Commission is reissuing licenses to these different entities. Eventually, Cotter Corporation acquired the materials, and they sent much of the material to their processing plant, in Canyon City, Colorado. Uh, However, there was a significant amount still in St. Louis, and they tried to find a disposal site that would take the material in. They got rejected numerous times, and eventually they decided to illegally dump it at the Westlake Landfill, which is a site that has not been designed to hold radioactive material. 
It is an unlined municipal landfill. This material is uncontained. It's sitting on the surface. It is uh, polluting the groundwater. It is only a mile away from the Missouri River, which is upstream from municipal water intakes. So you can see that this is a very harrowing, threatening situation. And what's particularly interesting, Libby, is when you start to delve into the primary source record, you find that there is potentially this agenda within the Atomic Energy Commission to sort of offload the liability for this material off of their balance sheet. And there's kind of a a trail of evidence that when you connect the dots between all these different events and motivations, it becomes very clear that the federal government is attempting to shirk its responsibility to ensure that the health threats associated with the nuclear weapons program, you know, that they don't want to be responsible for those health threats. And this is what's particularly criminal in my mind. And when I say criminal, I mean violations of law. Because the licensing of this material is very uh, dubious. They sold this material, which was nuclear byproduct material as defined in the Atomic Energy Act. They sold this material and licensed it as source material. And it's not source material. It is byproduct material. And there are specific protections designed within the Atomic Energy Act itself in the event that any byproduct material is mishandled or used in a way that's a violation of law or used in a way that's beyond the scope of the license. The Atomic Energy Commission is instructed explicitly by the law to recall that material. And so it becomes very interesting when you start to focus in on some of these issues of liability. And what we're facing now is most likely a $400 million cleanup tab. And ultimately, because the nuclear weapons program was designed to defend the national security of the United States, the folks that are suffering nearby the Westlake landfill are suffering due to the defense of our nation. And in essence, they are enemies left behind lines. And the federal government has a responsibility to step in to make this community whole again. When you say $400 million to clean this up, Is that just the Westlake site and the contamination that it has created, or is it all of the sites in the greater St. Louis area? That's just the Westlake site. And this uh, scope of work has not been defined literally. There have been some estimates that have been posited, and uh, that is one of the estimates. And that would involve removing this threatening material from the center of a county, a densely populated county of a million people, removing this material, removing the threat, and putting it in a licensed disposal facility away from water sources and away from population centers. And that's the holy grail, because we really don't have anything like that. The only way that the waste control specialist down in Texas, for example, gets away with qualifying for the waste is that they had the maps redrawn as to where the Oglala aquifer existed. The early maps showed them virtually on top of the aquifer and then later maps, and there was a lot of manipulation around this, showed it as being at some distance so that they qualified for taking in more waste. There really is no place for this to go, but it can't stay where it is now. There's even more reasons why the fantasy that this material can remain in situ in a safe capacity, whether they put a cap on it or whatever half measures have been suggested. It is a complete fantasy because the radioactivity of this landfill is only going to increase by orders of magnitude moving forward. That's called ingrowth. That's, that's a kind of a, a technical term, a scientific term, but it refers to increasing levels of radioactivity due to the thorium, the uranium, the radium that has been uh, discovered that is dumped at the Westlake landfill. In other words, as these materials break down, they will be releasing greater and greater quantities of radioactivity into the general environment. Correct. And one of the things that was illuminated in this peer-reviewed study, and this is kind of sort of a a low-hanging fruit with regard to proving that there is off-site radiological contamination, and that's in the form of radon gas 
that has escaped the landfill because what happens is uranium, thorium, radium has a decay series and there's a series of elements that it breaks down to over a series of years. One of the elements that uranium breaks down to, radium breaks down to, thorium breaks down to is radon gas, which has a half-life of 3.8 days. But during that time, it can move miles off site. And then a few other elements down the chain after that 3.8 day period is lead 210. Lead 210 is radioactive. It's a highly toxic material. It is a heavy metal. In fact, radon gas is the second leading cause of lung cancer. And of course, much of it is naturally occurring. But the point of the community is that when you have an artificial source of radioactivity that is man-made, clearly that becomes a greater health threat than what is naturally occurring. That's why it is so necessary to remove this material so that that threat is reduced by orders of magnitude. What the study authors discovered in doing in looking at 300 samples taken all around the landfill and also around some of the other legacy sites, including the Laddie Avenue site, which is also called the Hazelwood Interim Storage Site and the St. Louis Airport Site, and also the downtown Mallinckrodt Chemical Works site. What they discovered is that there was an inordinate amount of lead-210 in these samples, and when they compared the lead-210 to the other elements, the other members of the decay chain, they found that it was out of equilibrium, meaning it was out of balance, which means that the radon gas that eventually turned into lead-210 originated from the Westlake landfill. This is, of course, all extremely horrifying information and in terms of the contamination it may have been made worse by the recent severe flooding in St. Louis. There were even several videos that I saw, I believe you took one of them, of water that was rushing downward off the Westlake site during the storms and immediately thereafter that seemed to be emanating from the area where we know that the radioactive material was buried. Representative Bill Otto, whose district is where the Westlake landfill and Bridgeton landfills are located, he took some video, I took a video of a location where you could clearly see that storm rainwater runoff was coming from the designated radioactive areas. And you can see the radioactive signs on the chain leak fence. And the water was just rushing off of the hill, going into troughs that then fed the Missouri River. And so Bill asked the question, how can anyone make the argument that radiological material is not moving off site when you see the floodwaters moving directly off of the uh, radioactive uh, site where the area is, where the radioactive material is. And that material is on the surface in this area. Given that it's so obvious that radioactive material was most likely being flooded off of the top of the Westlake site, what does the EPA say about this runoff water, and on what do they base that pronouncement? Well, there seems to be a pattern of behavior where the agencies want to minimize any perceived threat. They want to obfuscate the issue. In the case of this specific instance, the EPA spokeswoman said, oh, well, no, that water isn't coming from the Westlake landfill. That water is coming from the Bridgeton landfill, which if you look on a Google map, the Bridgeton landfill is over 800 feet away from where we were filming. So it's just it just doesn't hold water <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to make a pun. And it's, it's really sad, Levy, that you have a federal agency that ostensibly is designed to protect the public against health threats, against toxicological hazards. You have this agency that just seems completely, utterly tone deaf with regard to how they're dealing with the Westlake landfill. And that's why the public and the Just Moms STL group and different community activists have been so outspoken on this because the situation is so dire that we're not getting any action on this. For four decades, we have not gotten any action on this. Senator Claire McCaskill and Senator Roy Blunt, in a bipartisan 
benefit of uh, rare cooperation, introduced legislation a, a couple months ago to strip the jurisdiction of the Westlake landfill away from the EPA and to grant it to the Army Corps of Engineers, which has the capacity to execute the removal of this waste. The Army Corps of Engineers, they have been a part of this narrative, the, new, the Manhattan Project, from the beginning. You may recognize that the official name for the Manhattan Project was actually the Manhattan Engineering District. And so the Army Corps of Engineers has been at the front end of this narrative. They have the expertise, and more importantly, they have a more pointed ability to handle the issues of liability with regard to the removal of this waste. So legislation has been proposed. It sounds like the Army Corps of Engineers, their FUSRAP program, is the right one to handle this because they have the experience, they have the history of dealing with it. How is the legislation going and where's the support and what, if any, pushback is there? There's been two bills that have been introduced, one in the Senate, which is Senate Bill 2306, and in the House of Representatives by Representative Lacey Clay and Representative Ann Wagner, also a bipartisan effort. That's House Resolution 4100. There has been an attempt to shut down this legislation by the landfill operator, the landfill owner, which is Republic Services, and they have been trying to finance citizen groups, or some refer to them as astroturf groups, because they're really forwarding a corporate agenda to protect the status quo and to do nothing with the site. That's the corporate agenda in this case. They have been trying to characterize the removal of this waste as being an even greater threat than leaving it there. And they're talking to folks in rural Missouri and outstate Missouri, and they're saying, you know, do you want radioactive material to come through your community? And they're trying to stir up this opposition, which is sort of synthetic and fake, because the bottom line is the Army Corps of Engineers, as I mentioned earlier, they have already removed over 1.2 million cubic yards, which is more than 1,200,000 tons of this material has been safely removed from North County from the other FUSRAP sites, the other Army Corps sites. And that material is put in specially constructed rail cars and it's shipped away from the state of Missouri. So for Republic Services to be financing efforts to say that this is going to be a massive threat if we actually clean up the area to make it safe for the local families and local residents that live near here, for them to say that that's going to be an even bigger problem just uh, doesn't pass the straight face test. How is Republic hurt if Foos Rap comes in? I mean, what could possibly be their objection to the sane and relatively safe, though this stuff is never safe, but the relatively safer handling that FUSRAP can provide when EPA has basically been going for years, for decades now. Republic Services is the second largest trash hauler in the United States. Bill Gates is a significant share holder. It is a, it is a large conglomerate corporation. And I think that they are probably erring towards the side of predictability and stability in regard to their preservation of the status quo. Right next to the landfill is a large trash transfer station where all the Republic Service trash trucks come and then they consolidate the trash into larger trucks that then go to the landfills. So there's perhaps a perception that the unknown aspects of what is really dumped at the Westlake landfill because Mind you, the Westlake landfill has never been fully characterized in a grid-like manner. That is another one of the criticisms that the community is leveling at the EPA. Because, like I mentioned earlier, the EPA doesn't know about off-site radiological contamination because they don't even look for it, really, in a comprehensive way. That's the perfect way for them to have deniability. Well, we didn't find anything. They didn't bother to say that they're not looking for anything. And it's a sad day when citizen groups need to amplify 
the uh, realities that we're facing, the sicknesses, the illnesses, the cancer clusters, and do all this discovery and all these efforts on our own with independent peer-reviewed scientific analysis, Missouri Attorney General Chris Coster has mounted an investigation, and several months ago, his experts uh, released evidence of radiological contamination in off-site tree core samples and also radiological contamination of groundwater. So it's sad that you have this kind of cross-jurisdictional nuclear Gordian knot, if you will, where everything is, is in a state of a ministerial paralysis. And at the end of the day, it's mothers who have lost their daughters due to brain cancer that are suffering. So there is a real trail of tears that is in the wake of the original sin of this uh, nuclear waste that's been orphaned in the heart of St. Louis County. That was very beautifully put. Where is the local media on this and how aware in general are the people of St. Louis of this massive problem that exists right smack up against their city? A few years ago, some would refer to St. Louis's role in the Manhattan Project as a best kept secret. However, because there's this encroaching landfill fire, which we haven't mentioned yet, there's a a landfill that's right next to the radioactive waste that has had what is referred euphemistically as a subsurface smoldering event. <laughs> um, but it's really, it's really. <laughs> I love yeah. bureaucratic language. That's some techno speak, isn't it? You know, so this fire has been burning for nearly six years and uh, they're just letting it burn. Like I mentioned earlier, Attorney General Chris Coster, his experts have shown evidence that the fire is moving closer to the radioactive waste and it's about a thousand feet away. And St. Louis County released emergency plans preparing for a radiological plume to be emitted from the landfill should the fire meet the radioactive waste. And so because of the imminence of the chance of like a dirty bomb essentially going off in the St. Louis region, this issue has been propelled into the national mainstream media and even international news. So the media here is really paying attention to this issue and You know, sadly, it's kind of like a standoff between a corporate financed agenda with regard to their talking points on the on the site that the site poses no threat, that we don't want to touch the stuff because if you touch it, then it's going to even be a bigger threat and that there's no radiological contamination moving off site. These are the talking points of the corporate side of things and and even the EPA sometimes, sadly. And then on the other hand, you have these independent experts like this recent peer-reviewed paper that are showing that indeed this is an ongoing threat, that the radiological contamination is moving off-site, and that you have the Attorney General's experts that are confirming that. So you have these kind of two competing narratives, and such is the case with politics, right? But I have to say that, and, and I, I have expressed this to the different groups um, when I've uh, had the chance to, to talk with folks, it's a righteous cause to be calling attention to the fact that there is cancer clusters that are emerging, that are presenting in this community. The state of Missouri did an extremely narrow study of uh, the zip code right around the landfill and discovered a 300% increase in childhood brain cancer. And that was an extremely narrow study that didn't even account for folks that moved away, etc. So you have these illnesses and autoimmune diseases that are emerging And you have property values that are plummeting. And so the community has called for the removal of the waste. They have said that we need to have a one-mile buyout of nearby residents, which is about 90 homes, and that we need property protection for the different businesses and residences that are in the region so that uh, they're not negatively impacted by really a liability that the entire United States of America should shoulder. Because, like I mentioned, this radiological contamination is there due to the defense of our nation. The Manhattan Project in early Cold War years is what's generated the hundreds of thousands of tons of nuclear waste byproducts. And so, you know, we spend a ton of money on our defense industry. And if we cannot clean up the mess created by the very first atomic weapons development, then what mess can we clean up? What 
can those of us who are listening to this narrative do to support the moms, the citizens, the ill people, the ones who live within one mile? What can we do to help support the people of North St. Louis and beyond? Well, first of all, you can join the Facebook page, Westlake Landfill because that operates as kind of a central repository of all these studies and all these news stories and all this information that's coming out. The next thing you can do is call your local senator or representative and ask them to support Senate Bill 2306. Ask them to support House Resolution 4100, which would transfer jurisdiction of the Westlake cleanup to the Army Corps of Engineers. These are kind of immediate calls to action that folks can do. At this point, I figured the interview was pretty much over, except for some boilerplate at the end. But as so often happens, our conversation veered off into a direction so informative that I would be remiss if I did not include it. Libby, I find it just unconscionable that the federal agencies like the EPA or the Army Corps of Engineers or the Department of Energy, they treat the exact same wastes that are located in different parts of the country, they have different standards of cleanup depending on where you are in the country. And it is significant, the different standards of cleanup. And this is a form of territorial discrimination. This is a form of environmental injustice that violates the civil rights of the folks that are not afforded the same level of cleanup. And St. Louis is one of those areas that is not afforded the same level of cleanup. For example, in 1983, there was an article that came out which talked about nuclear byproduct wastes that were stored in Fernald, Ohio. Now, those wastes had come from Mallinckrodt Chemical Works. They were stored at the airport site, which I've mentioned earlier, and then they were shipped to Fernald, Ohio for storage. Those wastes had some radium in it, At an earlier date, they were perceived to have some economic value. So the Belgian mining interest that had sold the Belgian Congo pitch blend, which was the most pure form of uranium, a freak of nature, this is ultimately what led to the success of the Manhattan Project. This pure form of uranium came to the United States, and the Belgian mining interest said, okay, you can have the uranium in there, but we want to retain ownership of some of the other materials in there in case at a later date we want to go get it. So they were storing it up in Ohio. And the Reagan administration in 1983, they said, okay, we will assume liability for this material and clean it up, but only if you allow us to place nuclear cruise missiles in Belgium. So you have this real dirty business dealing going on with cruise missiles being placed in Europe, and then all of a sudden, then, of course, the cleanup can take place. But it even gets worse because this is where the territorial discrimination comes into play. In the agreement to clean up those wastes in Fernando, Ohio, they say that they will either entomb the waste, which means full encapsulation in a disposal cell, or they will remove the wastes from the site so that it no longer threatens that community. In St. Louis, we don't get that. We don't get the perspective that says that we cannot allow tens of thousands of tons of highly radiotoxic material to lie in situ in the heart of a county of a million people. This is actually considered to be, well, maybe it's palatable. Maybe we can leave this material in the Westlake landfill and just put a cap over it, which is what the EPA was trying to suggest in their record of decision in 2008. I just find it actually shocking about this. And and even the EPA spokeswoman recently said that the same wastes in different parts of the country have entirely different uh, cleanup standards. And how does that make any sense? How does that make any sense when you have actual people suffering due to sicknesses, disease, and death because of the, the presence of this material? It is not right. It is not correct. And that's why this issue has been propelled into the national spotlight, because we are going to see this material removed. And I have made this a pledge in my campaign for state representative. You know, I'm running for state representative in the district where these landfills reside. And I have made a pledge that I will work tirelessly until we make this community whole again by protecting this community and removing that waste. 
And if you were in a position where you could wave a magic wand or an executive order and take action to make certain that this would happen, what would you want to see happen? What would you do? There have been calls to the White House. In fact, I have spoken to the White House legal team about this. I have a friend and colleague who's the general counsel to the executive office of the president. And the president is very much aware of the Westlake landfill. In fact, uh, recently, a local progressive hero in our community, Rabbi Susan Talbot, was uh, lighting the menorah at the White House. And she mentioned the moms that are working to clean up the Westlake landfill in the White House. If I could wave a magic wand, I would uh, transfer the site to the Army Corps of Engineers, which is what Senate Bill 2306 does and what House Resolution 4100 does. And I would uh, ensure that there would be uh, property protection for the plummeting property values for businesses and residents in a five-mile radius. And I would do a buyout of the 90 or so homes in the mile radius. And I would remove this material. It would act as a huge uh, economic stimulus for this community. I mean, St. Louis deserves this recompense. St. Louis deserves the protection that the federal government promised Malincrot in the original secret contracts for the Manhattan Project. The federal government said that they would assume the liability for any health threats associated with the process of generating and purifying this uh, uranium for the Manhattan Project. Those promises need to follow through. Like I mentioned in our first interview, Libby, the Atomic Energy Commission that sold this material, 125,000 tons of it for a buck a ton, that that was a violation of law. Them calling it source material to bypass the protection provisions within the Atomic Energy Act, that was a violation of law. And those, those aspects need to be brought to light so that the federal government will only have one course of action available to them, which is making this community whole again and protecting this community. And that's the only thing left for them to do. Sadly, you know, sometimes in democracy, you have to eliminate all the other games of distraction that are going on by corporate interests, by agencies that just want to kick the can down the road. You have to eliminate all those different options so that there's only one singular course left, which is a light at the end of the tunnel, which shows this community being made healthy and that health threat being removed from the St. Louis County, from Bridgeton, Missouri. From your mouth to somebody's ears. Byron, thank you again for an extremely articulate and passionate telling of the story of what's going on, including all of the political details you were able to include. And know that Nuclear Hot Seat's going to stay on this story. We will continue to report what's going on. I consider you a valuable source. And for now, thank you so much for being my guest again this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. That was Byron DeLear. Byron's earlier nuclear hot seat interview ran in episode number 228. Other programs which featured Westlake interviews include number 230, number 232, and our full-length special, number 227, which is where I spoke with Dr. Helen Caldicott on the health issues, former White House nuclear advisor Bob Alvarez on the history of the site, and Westlake Landfill Facebook page admin Don Chapman. Be sure to check those episodes out. Activist shout-out and final thought are one and the same this week. First, to everyone who took a breather during the holidays, note that you were able to step away from fighting nukes and surprise! They're still here, just waiting for you. Hopefully, you got enough rest, love, and other forms of emotional nourishment during the year-end break to be roaring back into action now in 2016. It's great to be in community with all of you, or y'all, as our activist community friends in the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League would say. Borrowing a thought from the 12-step world, We've got to take this one day at a time. Or rather, I need to take this one day at a time. Your mileage may vary. I know when I look at all that has to be done, 
I can easily slip on that banana peel of depression and lose all sense of what's possible. Meanwhile, I take a headlong dive into a vat of premium ice cream and binge-watch Iron Chef America. That's where my brain and my heart and my weight were stuck over the holidays. But in coming out of that emotionally loaded time, and I want to acknowledge with gratitude right now everyone who responded with love and support when I posted about this on Facebook, I'm again seeing what I can do one day today that can help turn this nuclear Godzilla around. As we approach the five-year anniversary of Fukushima, the 30-year anniversary of Chernobyl, and 37 years since Three Mile Island, we can only do what we can do to try and make certain there are no more catastrophic nuclear anniversaries to celebrate. Whether we succeed or not, no one can tell. But speaking for myself, Working on this issue sure beats retirement, and it's a heck of a lot better than either ice cream or Iron Chef America. Here's to a kick-ass anti-nuclear 2016 for us all. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 5, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from... ENEnews.com, STLToday.com, KSDK.com, Examiner.com, ScienceDirect.com, TribLive.com, NOLA.com, NWNewsNetwork.org, NBCSanDiego.com, WYFF4.com, Fox5SanDiego.com, KnoxBlogs.com, ReviewJournal.com, Yahoo.com, ScienceBlog.com, KNAU.org, NationalGeographic.com, Bloomberg.com, Reuters, U.S. News, Christian Science Monaster, FukuLeaks.org, Fukushima-Diary.org, Tokyo Electric Power Company, Asahi.com, QHA.org, DailyCause.com, DailyMail.co.uk, FocusTaiwan.tw, DW.com, WalesOnline.co.uk, Nuclear-News.org, HeraldScotland.com, BBC.com, JapanTimes.co.jp, DabangaSudan.org, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook Community which you are all invited to like and join and hang out on and post on. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, and recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly Veterans Truth Network, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and as of this week, we welcome our latest community to join the syndication net, ActivateMedia.org. It's based in Boston and an offshoot of the Occupy movement. Yum! If you're new to Nuclear Hot Seat, check out the archive, everyone. You can find us on iTunes under Podcast, on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, and on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. And if you just choose to link with us on your website, shoot me an email and let me know about it. Glad to have you on board. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now do not hit that snooze button and don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.